The story takes place when I was 19 years old. At the time, I was dating a guy, and it had only been a couple of months. My parents had gone to a trip to visit family in the US. I grew up in Mexico. I decided to sneak my then boyfriend into the house to spend a week with me while they were gone. I never would have expected what happened. My parents left me their car, my first ever, and my boyfriend, who used to be a professional level bodybuilder and trainer, knew a lot of shady people. One night he tells me this friend wants to meet up in a city. It's about a half hour-ish drive from the town I lived in. As I was the one with the car, I was down to drive him and meet his friend. We met at a shady bar in a so-so part of the city. I was instantly uncomfortable with this guy. He was too familiar, too comfortable, too obnoxious to everyone, myself included. All of a sudden, after a private talk outside between him and my then boyfriend, my boyfriend approaches me and says that we need to give him a ride back to my place. I'm sorry, I'm not comfortable with this. He was a bit nervous as he tells me quietly to shush. This isn't someone we can afford to offend. I ask why he can't drive himself, to which I'm told he's too intoxicated and needs a private setting to talk. As dumb as I was, I ended up agreeing. I was very uncomfortable and had a terrible feeling the whole way home, which my boyfriend drove. We get home, they sit outside, and suddenly this man starts demanding I cook him dinner. I was a very obstinate teen. I hated, and still do, being told what to do. As I began to deny him, my ex-boyfriend looks at me, a bit pale, and shakes his head. I go in, fuming at that order and feeling bossed around in my own home, and then I make them a simple dinner. After his friend left, I learned from my ex-boyfriend that that guy was the head narco of our city. I mean, the head honcho. I was livid he brought this guy to my family's home. He was very pushy, and without words, slightly threatening. So I strongly feel that if I had made a mistake, it very well could have ended terribly for me. This happened to me about two to three years ago. When I was 16, I used to work at a fast food restaurant. I live in a place where we have all seasons. At this point in time, it was winter, so it got dark pretty early, like around 5 to 6 p.m. I was called to come into work this particular day, but the weather was kind of bad, causing us to not have any customers. As a result, we had to close the store early. It was about 5.30 p.m. when my manager left, locking the store and making me wait outside for my ride. About 20 minutes had passed since she left, and I was really cold. So I decided, regrettably, that I would walk to a friend's house just a few blocks away. About a 10-minute walk, and I would wait for my ride there. The store I worked at was on a busy street that was near a residential neighborhood, as I walk away from the store, I started walking down the residential street behind the store. I was walking on the sidewalk to the left of the street, as the sidewalk on the other side had woods behind it. It was convenient as well, because on the left side of the street was my store, and there were no street lights. I walked about three-fourths of the block when I got this feeling that I was being watched. The neighborhood was really dark, and at this point, I'd pretty much reached the end of the block, and I was getting ready to cross the street when I noticed the silhouette of someone walking on the right side of the road near the woods. They were about 5 foot 9 to 5 foot 10, looked to be maybe 180 or 200 pounds. I couldn't make out any features though. I'm the type of person who's very aware of their surroundings and slightly paranoid as I've been followed, almost kidnapped, stalked and whatever else, you get the gist. So when I noticed him, I stopped walking and immediately got a sick feeling in my stomach. The man then noticed me and proceeded to walk slowly and yell out to me. He yells, 
Yo, come here. I want to talk to you. No, I'm good. I'm only 16. I yell back. I then turn around and start walking back to my store. He continues to yell things at me, trying to convince me to come to him. At that point, something in me told me to run, and I did just that. As I'm running, I know I shouldn't have, but I turned my head to see if he was actually chasing me, and to my horror, he was. So I turned up the speed and run as fast as I can. Thankfully, as I reached the store, my right had pulled up, so I ran to the car. As I tried to get in, the door was locked. It took about 20 seconds for them to unlock the car, and it felt like hours. Eventually, I got in and just broke down, crying. I'm not gonna lie, I'm kind of out of shape, so my back was hurting from breathing so hard, and I was all frazzled. This was the first time I was chased on foot, and let me tell you, it's so much more scary, surreal, and intense being chased on foot than someone chasing you by car. Still, to this day, I have added trauma from this incident, and it makes it hard to go anywhere by myself, especially in the dark. So, to the man that chased after me in the dark, let's not meet again. My three-year-old son suffered from chronic ear infections last year, which led him to having high fevers. I slept with him on this particular night because I needed to give him Tylenol throughout the night to keep his fever down and to keep him comfortable. I set my alarm to wake me up at around 2.30 a.m. When I woke up, I went into the kitchen to get the Tylenol. I noticed a bright light shining into the apartment from our deck door which also illuminated part of the woods behind the apartment. When I went over to see what it was, it turned out to be a car with those bright LED headlights in the parking lot to the far back right of the apartment. I figured they were dropping someone off. I saw the movement of what resembled a dog walking around near the woods. I started to think that the lady who usually walks her dog, the cute little corgi, in that area purposely faced her car in that direction so she could see while she walked her dog. As it got closer, I realized that there was nobody out there walking a dog, and there was no dog. I don't know what it was that I saw, but I'll describe it in the best way I can. At first, it looked just like a dog, corgi size, but as it walked closer, it looked like your average house cat. Then it looked like a black bear, and then it looked like a koala. I live in New Jersey, and there are no wild koalas here. At this point, my heart is pounding out of my chest, and I'm scared. The fear I felt was like a primal type of fear that I've never felt before. I ran to my bedroom to wake up my boyfriend, and I shook him awake very roughly. I said, you gotta come see this. He was a bit annoyed with me. When we look outside together, we see this thing getting closer and it looks like a skunk now. White stripe down the center with a perky, fluffy tail. I said, oh, it's just a skunk, with a little chuckle. I felt a bit embarrassed that I woke him up over a damn skunk, but at that moment, I also felt relieved. However, I was mistaken. As it walked, it looked as if it was struggling to find a form. I thought it looked like it was falling apart, but also coming back together again at the same time. I know this doesn't make sense, but it's hard to find the words for what we saw. After the skunk formation, it looked like a person crawling on the ground with some type of fur or skin attached to them around the leg. Then it changed again, and it looked like a raccoon, groundhog, black bear, cat, koala, deer, and skunk. The part that stuck out to me the most was that whatever it was seemed to be coming apart or shedding, but at the same time, it was growing. Whoever had their headlights on turned them off as it went deeper into the woods. This happened pretty quick. I'd say it was only about a couple of minutes from start to finish. 
My boyfriend ended up going back to bed, but I couldn't sleep after that, so I grabbed a flashlight and shined it into the woods to see if I could see it again, but it was gone. I also opened the door to see if I could hear anything, but I couldn't. It was very quiet. I had a very hard time going back to sleep that night. My boyfriend wasn't scared, but he was confused and stunned. He didn't know what to make of it. I was scared and creeped out. I know if I hadn't woken him up to see it for himself, he most likely wouldn't believe me and would have chalked it all up to me being groggy from just waking up, or possibly it just being an animal. Unfortunately, I know what I saw, and I'll never forget it. I was 23 and had a long distance boyfriend. He would come and see me, and on this day we parked outside of a natural trail and fooled around in the car briefly before I exited. None of the vehicles in the lot appeared to be occupied, but I was wrong. I'm about to get out of the car and decide to grab my knife out of my bag before I start walking the trail. I normally wouldn't do that. I also decided to put a bigger t-shirt over my tank top. I said goodbye to my boyfriend and started down the trail. I wanted to walk before going home. This isn't a hidden trail. This is a populated area. If you run about a minute down the road from the trail entrance, you're outside a business. As I'm walking, I start to sense someone is behind me. I'm currently holding my knife in front of my body. I continue walking and finally look back to see a middle-aged man following me. As I pick up speed, he does as well. I tell myself I'm being paranoid. It's the middle of the day. How would he even do anything to me? Because he continues to follow and I see a bench coming up, I decide that the best thing to do is to hurry up to the bench that's facing the trail and hold my knife out in front of me in an obvious way. I cannot express to you how shocked I was to see when I sat down and he saw my knife. He put an even larger knife into his pocket. I couldn't believe it. He saw the face I made and he ran off immediately to an adjacent trail that was deeper into the wooded area. I got up and started running the main trail he'd followed me down. When I got to the parking lot, there was one vehicle. A truck, running, with no one inside. I'm guessing this was his vehicle. I continued running until I was in the middle of town. I don't know what to make of this. Surely if he got me there, someone would have heard or seen it. Are people really that bold? I also think he may have confused me for a sex worker, because he may have seen me in the car. Are there any thoughts? I'd flown to Denver, Colorado for a business meeting. We'd signed a new client, and I was going there to learn their processes and systems before we went live handling their freight. I'm a flatlander and have been warned that people visiting Denver for the first time often developed symptoms of altitude sickness. So when I started feeling bad at the end of my second day, I brushed it off as nothing too serious and went to bed. At some point after dark, I woke up dizzy, delirious, and in pain, and I knew I needed help. I'm naturally hard-headed and have a great huge helping of social anxiety, so actually asking for help is something I'm almost physically incapable of doing. But I needed it, so I split the difference, and instead of picking up the phone and dialing 911, or even calling down to the front desk to croak out a help me, I picked up my phone and googled after hours urgent care, thinking that surely, in a place the size of Denver, there'd be some sort of walk-in clinic open at night. And what do you know? There was, sort of. 
so I carefully copied the address into my Waze app and, squinting against the light that felt like daggers being shoved into my eyes, I stumbled through getting dressed and making my way down to the parking lot, then followed the voice prompts across the city to a place called, wait for it, after hours urgent care. I got there, parked the car, stumbled to the door, walked in, and then realized to my horror and dismay that it was on the second floor and there was no way I was going to be able to crawl up the stairs. I was leaning against the wall, contemplating my fate, when there was a ding, and the wall disappeared. I caught my balance in time to realize that I'd been leaning against the elevator door, found a large friendly button with a number two on it, pressed it, and closed my eyes for the ride. The ride up took somewhere between 30 seconds and 30 years. Logic tells me that it was probably the former, but my memory insists that it was closer to the latter. In any case, the next time I managed to pry my eyes open, I was slowly making my way through the door to the check-in counter, closing one eye so I could focus and carefully writing my name on the clipboard. A short time skip later, I was sitting in a chair against the wall, hearing my name called. I got up, followed the average of the two people leading me down the hall, and time skipped again, ending up sitting on the crinkly paper-covered exam bed while my vitals were taken. The nurse asked me some questions, which I must have answered, and turned to walk out. I begged her to turn off the lights, and she did, and I fell back onto the crinkly paper and passed out. Sometime later, the lights flicked back on. I screamed. The lights went back out. A doctor came in, asked me some questions about my reason for being in town, business, and my drug use, which was not, and then left again. I passed out again. And then there was a group of people standing, silhouetted in the doorway, wearing gowns and goggles and gloves and face masks, and very pointedly not approaching my bed. One of them spoke. Mr. Adams, who drove you here tonight? I drove myself, I replied. Okay, we need to get you to the hospital. Can you drive yourself, or should we call you an ambulance? Give me the address. I'm okay. And then I could hear the silhouettes in the doorway whispering to themselves. After a minute, the voice came back and said, We'll be right back. I passed out. A while later, the lights flicked on. I screamed. The lights flicked off. Two people squeezed in with a gurney, and I ended up on it. The lights were still stabbing me in the head, so I threw my arm over my eyes for the ride down the hallway. And then we were at the elevator, and the gurney would fit on the elevator, or the two people would fit on the elevator. And then I was in the elevator, and they were gone. Then the elevator doors opened, and they were there again. And then out the door we went. It was all so confusing. There was then an ambulance, but we couldn't get to it. There was a shrubbery in the way. The driver had seen Monty Python, the EMT hadn't. She thought I was delirious when I started quoting the knights who say knee. I probably was. The driver started quoting back. The tech started losing her mind. It was a good time. I passed out. I woke up being rolled through an ER. I passed out. I woke up on a different bed. I passed out. I woke up in an MRI. I passed out. I woke up back on the bed. At some point, I must have texted my wife. Something like, I'm in the hospital, but don't worry. I'm fine. And she found a friend of mine who lived in the area, and he started calling and driving around to hospitals looking for me. I don't know how long he searched, but he eventually found me. So I'm fine, right? Right. Maybe not. Apparently, I have meningitis, so that's fun. Now, the next part of this I remember, very concerned-looking people started explaining to me the difference between viral and bacterial meningitis. So, Mr. Adams, if this is viral meningitis, you just need to get rest and get plenty of fluids, and it'll clear up on its own in a few days. And if it's bacterial meningitis, we need to start you on an IV antibiotics right away or there's a good chance you will die. 
So how do we know which is which, I ask? Well, we can wait a few hours and see if you get worse. Or we can jab a needle into your spine and suck some fluid out for testing. Let's just wait, I reply. Or we could jab a needle into your spine, he asked again. Do I seem to be getting worse, I asked. No, but if you do. If I do, you can start me on antibiotics, I questioned. Yes, but if we wait, let's wait. Or again, we could jab a needle into your spine, he persists. Do we have to, I asked. Well, no, but this went on for some time, and I eventually gave in and let them stick a needle into my spine. Good news, it's not bacterial, the doctor informed me. Yay? I quizzically asked. You can go home, he told me. No, I can't. I'm over a thousand miles from home. You can go back to your hotel then. Shouldn't I stay a while? No. Just take it easy and drink plenty of water, and you'll be okay in a few days. Cool, cool, I told him. So my friend helped me sign out and drove me to get my rental car, which was still parked at the clinic. Then he followed me to my hotel, where we dropped off the rental. He then took me to get some pizza. That's taking it easy, right? I somehow ended up back at the hotel and passed out again. I woke up in time to go to the next day's meetings. Now, the doctor had said to take it easy and drink plenty of fluids. Fluids are easy, plenty of bottled water. Easy is unfortunately subjective. I'm a delivery guy. I'm used to loading and unloading trucks and moving stuff around in warehouses. So a day of meetings and walking around is pretty easy to me. So I went to my meetings and I walked around the customer's warehouse, and I did what I could to learn their systems. And I had splitting headaches, dizziness, nausea, delirium, basically all the things that meningitis causes. So I just wrote it off as the virus that I'd been told would go away in a few days. And the next day, I checked out of the hotel, and I drove to turn in my rental car and took a shuttle to the airport to fly home. The shuttle driver took pity on me and helped me load and unload my bag, and I trudged into the airport to check in. Walking into the airport was like a bad acid trip. The entire building was spinning around me. I spotted a check-in kiosk, made my way to it, and maybe because my brain wasn't functioning properly, maybe because the machine wasn't working right, I couldn't get checked in. There was a line at the one-staffed counter so I made my way to the end of it and sat down on the floor. The next thing I was aware of was an elderly gentleman in a bright red jacket leaning carefully over me and saying, for what was probably the second or third time, Sir, do you require medical assistance? Yes, yes, I think I do. And I was lying down. And then I was being loaded into an ambulance. I passed out. I woke up. I was being rolled into another hospital, and over the course of the next few hours, I learned the extent of my fuck-up. Apparently, when you have a needle jabbed into your spine and are told to take it easy for a few days, what you're actually supposed to do is stay in bed so your spine can heal. When you don't stay in bed, your cerebrospinal fluid just sort of leaks out of your spine through the hole they poked. Reduced pressure in your skull causes splitting headaches, nausea, dizziness, light sensitivity, basically all the things I've been dealing with and writing off as meningitis. To fix the leak, they had to do what's called a blood patch, which entails drawing blood from your hand and then pumping that blood into your spine by jabbing another needle into it. Sounds brutal, but the headaches and nausea started fading within minutes, like magic. I was still sick as a dog, but not apparently in imminent danger of my head exploding. Someone managed to get in touch with my wife, who called my brother, who booked emergency flights for them to come and get me out of the hospital, and I spent the next several days recuperating in another hotel before I was well enough to fly home.
When I first got out of the army, I was in a relationship with a guy in the 3rd Ranger Battalion. His name was Jim. He and I had an apartment together, and I thought I loved him. So instead of going back to my home in Nebraska, I stayed in Columbus, Georgia. Our relationship started out with him being what I thought was protective over me. Even though I was very attractive at the time, I had very low self-esteem because of an assault I'd experienced while I was living in the barracks and the bullying I endured afterward. Things moved very quickly. In fact, we were inseparable from the night we met. Anytime another man looked at me, he would get very confrontational toward that guy. I felt safe and protected by this. It made me feel special. I thought he must really value me if he would get so upset by a guy looking my way at first. Soon, when we would be out at a bar, he would get hammered every time and acted very nasty towards me if he thought I was looking at another guy. This would cause bitter fights, and I would always end up in a fetal position in bed, sobbing. But still, I stayed. The next day, he would always apologize, making excuses about being because he was so drunk, but then he would proceed to explain to me why what I had done was wrong. It wasn't long before I found myself totally isolated from my friends and family, because he was so insecure he made me take all of my phone calls on speakerphone. My family begged me to leave, but I was afraid I couldn't get by on my own. Then one night, we came home from the bar in the usual fashion, him screaming in my face and me sobbing. I told him I was going to get a room at a motel, and he lost his mind. He yanked the keys out of the ignition and threw them into the wood line. He then got out of my car and proceeded to kick in the front quarter panel of my car. He used so much force, the hinges to the passenger door were bent. I told the insurance company it was a hit and run, or I never would have been able to get the damage fixed. He screamed at me to get inside the apartment, but I couldn't unlock the door without my keys, which he blamed me for. He then grabbed me and started shoving me into the front door, first by my shoulders, then with his hands around my throat, screaming, Can't you see how much I love you? No, no, I can't, I rasped. He let go, and I fell to the ground in a heap. That night, I had finally had enough. I was finally so angry that I didn't feel afraid anymore. That morning, while he was sleeping it off, I began to make plans. I started by telling him he had to leave and move back into the barracks. When he refused, I had to get his chain of command involved to make him leave the apartment and go back to live in the barracks, on someone's couch, in the street, anything, just as long as it wasn't with me. He stopped me mercilessly. I filed for an OP, but he bullied me into dropping it. I knew I would never be free from him if I stayed so my parents sent me money via Western Union. This was in 2002. I rented a Penske truck and a trailer, got help from my neighbor guy friends to load it up as soon as the sun set, and I brought it from where I'd hidden it. My best chance was to leave under the cover of darkness. I was really sick that night. I was running a fever of 103 degrees, but I knew it had to be then. It couldn't wait. I just told myself that I had to get out of the city limits, then I could pull over and sleep a bit. I figured I would just drive as much as I could and then rest when I couldn't push any harder. I put my puppy in the cab of the truck with me, towed my car behind it, and left. I don't know how, except through divine intervention. But somehow, I managed to drive non-stop from Fort Benning, Georgia, to my parents' home in rural Nebraska. I stopped only for fuel, at which time I would feed, water, and walk my little dog, Scruffy, use the facilities and get what food and drink I could afford on my meager budget. I drove 14 hours and pulled into my parents' drive at around 10 a.m. CST. I crashed on their old couch and slept for nearly 24 hours straight. 
I still hoped for nothing but pain and suffering for him. He turned me onto pills, then coke, then crack, all while he was on active duty. He was a scumbag of a soldier and a man. He reached out to me on social media a couple of years ago. I told him what a steaming piece of shit he was and to rot in hell. It felt amazing, even after all these years, to say that to him and have him be the one stammering. I'm actually glad he reached out to me and gave me the opportunity to verbally rip him to shreds. I'm not afraid of you anymore, Jim. Let's not ever meet again. This one isn't huge, but it is real, and my husband and I think about it a lot. One time I was at urgent care to get an injury checked out. My husband was with me, as he usually is for anything medical. The waiting room when you walk in through the door has a long counter at the front, chairs surrounding a TV to the right, and on the left, there's a little divot in the wall where more chairs can rest in front of a bathroom door. It's a single-person bathroom with no window and only one door. We were sitting in some of the chairs close to the bathroom door. It was kind of in its own micro hallway, and the only exit from walking out of the bathroom was to walk past my husband and I. After sitting there for a while, a man walks in with his wife through the front door of the waiting room. They don't go to the check-in counter, but rather talk right in front of the door for about 30 seconds, maybe a minute. I didn't catch what they were talking about. The woman nods and leaves through the front door, and the man pauses to look around the room once he's alone. I assumed she was dropping him off to get checked out. His eyes meet the door to the bathroom, and he walks straight there instead of checking in, going inside, and then locking the door. My husband and I continue to wait there. Five minutes pass. Ten. Fifteen. 20. We waited there for a long time, and he never came out. However, I think we've all had times where we spent a good hour in the bathroom, so we just assumed maybe he had a stomach bug. Later, a woman from the waiting room goes up to the bathroom door to use it. After the man had been in there for about 30 minutes, she opens the door, no problems. The lock suddenly wasn't engaged. She goes in to use the restroom, coming out a few minutes later and going back to her seat. My husband and I looked at each other confused. He went to look in the bathroom, and the man wasn't there. There were no other windows or doors to exit from. The man was just gone, without a trace. We never did figure out where he went, but we do think about it fairly often. I was in a smallish fishing boat charter that sank a little less than 12 miles from a Caribbean island in the Atlantic. From the first sign of trouble to looking straight down at the boat slowly sinking beneath the surface was only about 10 minutes time. Trust me when I say that's an image I'll never forget. A white sport fisher being swallowed by the dark blue beneath me. When boats sink, they sink. Somewhere in the chaos, the captain called his friends in the marina before the boat sank, so we waited there, just drifting for a while, collecting any floating debris we could hang on to. Fortunately, we had life vests on, otherwise I'd have no doubt we'd all be dead. Two hours pass. Nobody comes by to pick us up. Clouds and rain are more frequent, so we lose sight of the island occasionally and I finally convince everyone to agree to start swimming towards the island. I know the best thing to do is stay together and not move, but the island didn't seem too far away, and it was obvious to me that nobody was going to find us at this point. Just as we start slowly moving, a helicopter comes and hovers somewhere between us and the island, presumably over the coordinates the captain gave his friends. I swim my ass off towards that thing, and in doing so, lose sight of the captain and first mate. 
So now it's just me and my sister. And then the helicopter leaves. That sucked. But, given the weather, there was almost zero chance of them spotting us unless we were right under them. We decide our best chance at survival is to keep swimming towards the island. The whole time it's rainy, cloudy, rough seas, and much of the time we can't see the island at all, and we use the wind as our directional guide. That sensation of not being able to see anything but grey skies and waves, with nothing to grasp onto, was the toughest part. We did see another helicopter before nightfall when the weather started clearing a bit, but it was way too far away from us. Nightfall is also when we can tell that we actually made progress and were getting closer to the island, but the darkness changes all that, as all we could look at were a handful of lights on the island and a bright spot that it was probably a resort, seven or so miles to the north. Fast forward to maybe 2 or 3 a.m., some 15 to 16 hours after the boat sank, and we actually get to the island. Of course, it's mostly cliffs. The water is colder, so we swim south until we can see water that isn't white. We get out of the water maybe an hour later and can barely walk. There are some lights in the distance, but no way we were going to get to them in our condition, so we just try to stay warm under some trees out of the rain. No sleep just shivering and trying to stay warm. Finally, the sun comes up and we're able to stop shivering. We can walk somewhat better now, so we start drinking from a nearby stream, assuming we'll be able to get help before we die from some parasite, and start hiking over the hills. I tossed my life vest into a tree just in case someone spots it. The hike takes us a few hours over two ridges and through some pretty thick brush, Fortunately, there were a few more streams. We finally get to a makeshift farm of sorts and decide to eat some bananas from a small banana grove. That's when we spot a guy walking to work on the farm. He feeds us some crackers and water and walks up the road to call the police for us. Based on where we got to land, they changed their search and found the captain and first mate in the water shortly thereafter. We all end up in hospital around the same time and we finally got to escape the hospital after 36 hours and several bags of IV fluids. There's a lot more that happened in that whole 72 hour period, but you get the idea. Funny thing, we went back about 8 months later and tried to get a boat to take us out to where we got to land, but they said it was too dangerous. It was all over the news for like 2.6 minutes, like everything these days. Even though we all survived, I still have PTS from that event, which sucks. It's pretty well triggered when I'm on the water and it's stormy, or in planes and it's turbulent, but PTSD be damned. I'm planning on buying a sailboat by the end of the year and sailing around the Caribbean and Central America, and if I can't get enough blue water experience, maybe across the Pacific, we'll see. I was 29. I was having chest pains. They were reminiscent of when I was younger. I rushed to the hospital just for it to be heartburn. I started treatment for that, but it got to a point where I couldn't move. I was sent home from work and went to my doctor. I described everything and said it just felt like bad heartburn. The doctor starts looking at stuff and treating me for GERDs. Just as she's about to send me on my way, she says she wants to do an EKG. After the results, she brought in a more experienced doctor, who agreed with her and said that they want to keep me overnight for observation. I get to the hospital and they hook me up with a ton of devices. There are multiple tests and they start medicating me. All they told me before I fell asleep from the meds was I had an enlarged and weakened left ventricle. It's now maybe 3 a.m., I'm awoken to the creepiest looking doctor ever. He had this skeleton thin body, but with a round pot belly. Think Farnsworth from Futurama. He was bald, but with this greasy stringy hair that was like long, and he draped a few over his head. 
Meanwhile, I'm still drugged out and afraid of what's going on. He pulls up a chair and asks if I know what's going on. He says I had a nibble of a heart attack, using his pointer finger and thumb to indicate very small. He explains something about numbers, and if they hit a certain number, it indicates a heart attack, and mine hit the number directly next to it. So let's say 10 means a heart attack. I hit a 9. Bear in mind, my dad died of a heart attack when he was 39. I'm laying there freaked out. Everyone I know is asleep, so I have no one to talk to. I'm too drugged out to do anything. I just pushed the button for more drugs to go back to sleep. They did a heart catheter and said my arteries were clean. Months later, I found I had a flu-like virus that went untreated. It reached my heart before my body fought it off. I'd gone to a MedExpress place a month before because I was sick with flu-like symptoms, but they lasted two weeks. The doctor said, it's the flu. You're young, you'll get over it and he never did any tests. I had to wear a heart defibrillator for about four months after that, and I'm on heart medication for the rest of my life. All because the express doc was too lazy to test anything. But that night shift doctor looked like death, and I thought he was coming to tell me that I died. I'm not and have never been a security guard, but I remember one time, I was closing the store with my boss. We locked the front door as we closed and cleaned. This was late at night. Well, near the end of our shift, we heard scratching at our store's front door. It's a glass door, an automatic slider, but as I said, it was locked. We originally shrugged it off as an animal or tweaker. That was until we finished cleaning. My manager heard scratching at the back door, but it can't be opened from the outside. Someone or something was trying to get in. The scratching was violent and near the lower part of the door. My boss was back there, finishing up the inventory check as it happened. He shouted at whoever it was, basically said to leave or were calling the cops. The scratching stopped right after that and he made sure the door was locked from the inside too by procedure. Well, he also opened the door to look around. He saw no one or anything, but there were claw marks where the scratching was. Animals are not uncommon in the area, but it's stray dogs and cats and such, normal stuff. These claws were not normal, not our normal at least. My boss came up to the front where I was putting cleaning stuff away, I was at our main checkout area next to the front door. I asked what happened. He told me. We heard a loud scratching sound at the front door again, but we both turned pale as we saw a human-like hand with claws at the front door and we saw two eyes that were reflective. I was young and actually quite strong. My manager is a shorter and smaller guy. He's also older. He called the police and we didn't leave until the police were at our door. The officer escorted us to our rides and as we left, he followed us. Even the cops saw this. As we pulled out of the driveway in a line, we saw a human-like head peeking at us from the bottom of the building's corner. We all pulled out and stopped at a nearby gas station. The cop confirmed what we saw and he had some other cops drive by, then they looked around. Despite what we saw and what cameras saw, we still don't know what it was. The officer was pretty sure it was a prank, because he went around the area and asked anyone with cameras facing our store. He asked for footage and saw nothing on it. It didn't happen again. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story you'd like me to read on the channel, please send me an email or post it to my subreddit.
You can find details of this in the video description. It's the stories that make this, and this is the best way to ensure variety in the stories I share. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my channel members and patrons who now have special access to ad-free videos and other behind-the-scenes content. Taylor Ruist, Annalisa Petrie, Jasmine Davis, Janelle Jensen, Jasper Roth, Alex, Monica Levelace, James Gargano, Sarah P, Fire 05, Mad as a Felter, Tierra Sanders, Melissa Kingery, Kitty Cat Luna 2, Chelsea Moffat, Ryan, Gabrielle, Jenny, Sarah, Zep Tepe, Sarah C, Sam, Amanda Jane, Vampy Debs, October Gypsy, Rebecca, Erica B, Maribel De Luna, Lloyd Rash, Jennifer Jenkins, Kelly Townsend, Mary Wright, Tara Harris, Elizabeth Knapp, Eddie, Sean Gorman, Sue Gordon, Spider's Web, Kay, Christy, Absinthe Alice, Dina Kingery, Snowball Rathena, Lady Drackard, Brenda, Pretty Girl 215, Amber Davis, Sigma Cube X, Letitia Acklin, Ali O'Neill, Gina Eberhardt, Lilypad, Ashley Nicole, Sarah Chifalo, May 2nd, 2003, Bella Plays, 2006, Skin Crawler, Stephanie McLaren, Borderline Betty, Kuro, Top Op, Kelly Ann Bain, Michael O'Malley, Neil Kavanagh, The Dead Movie Society, Diana Johnston, Taya Atwell, Danielle, Possum Posse, Crafty Kell, Brooke, Scott McKenzie, Megan Abrams, Jane Wiggins, Jasmine Davis, Jack White, Your Pappy's Dilly, Emma Lisa, Tanya Ferguson, The Wendy, Ember Hops, Alexia Tuttle, Ram Beltran, Elizabeth Mayers, Unladylike 13, Pegasus Genesis, Sheila Grant 44, Sona, Scout Mom 405, Cheryl Duckworth, Ashley Bray, Angela Reeves, Kim Thompson, Brock Bollard, Nick Bigdowski, Jessica Lasley, Yennefer, Clary Scott, Timothy Stratton, Melissa Kingery, Shane Stevens, Serge Vargas, Bart in Real Life, April Jordanet, Lisa Prentice, Mason Hayes, Sarah Price, Jasmine Thomas, Angie Lindop, Z. Harris, Kirby Harris, Yolo Sapien, Lavina Cordelia, Misty Racour, Michelle Green, Dixie Busby, Paula Ferreira Nieves, Samantha Place, Donna Cox, Stephen Wheeler, Melissa Moore, Deshaun Edmondson, This Bad Kitty, Gloria, Christina Myway, Connie Sue, Carol Zaffirano, Merciful Humming, Kelsa Rundle, Ashley Juster, Vicky Howell, Joe Tozer, Zoe D, Nicholas Johnson, Kimmy Love. Once again, thank you guys for listening. Have a great night.